Hello, welcome back to Catholic Reboot. You know, I had done an episode on Good Friday, and uh, I, it was actually pretty good. I mean, I went through uh, the entire meaning of the Holy Friday service, broke everything down, what it meant, what it represented, and at the end of it, I uh, watched it, and then I threw it out. Uh, mostly because I think when we're dealing with the Holy Trinidad, which is uh, Holy Thursday all the way through uh, the vigil on Easter, uh, which is Saturday or Holy Saturday, we're, we're really in a whole different place, right? And although we're, we're practicing it in our church and it's very important, I would like to think this is the three most important days of our spiritual year and it's the time that we are really uh, for the first time just practicing it right uh, instinctively right so uh, what do I mean by that well you know when I started this reboot series it was uh, actually started uh, through the words of my uh, granddaughter Gianna this very innocent uh, young girl who had questions and it just so happened that it lined up at the beginning of Lent so it was just this perfect timing kind of thing and one of the first series uh, I spoke about was to know to love and to serve God and then quickly went into the angels right because that's where uh, quite a few of her questions were um, what's interesting about that is uh, for many of you uh, that know the life of Padre Pio, who, by the way, we're really fortunate that we were uh, alive in the same century he was. I mean, I think I was maybe seven years old when he died, but we could at least touch that part of part of our history. And it was said that uh, so many people wanted to see him, to ask him questions, but there just wasn't enough time. So he would say, send your angel to me. And, and they would. And uh, this, this did two things. It revitalized our understanding of the importance of angels in our lives. But it also uh, made us realize that spiritually we're always in it. Even though in our world today things are so secularized that we forget that we live in a spiritual world, right? Where there's always assistance uh, as long as we ask for it, right? And what was kind of humorous about Padre Pio is so many people would send their angels to him that he would have to write them back and say, your, your angel came to me, I understand the issue. And then he would either resolve or explain to them in a letter what it was they were seeking. But at the same time, uh, he would be a little humorous and write someone back and say, look, stop sending your angel with the same message, right? We, we've already resolved that issue. Well, what does that show? It, it shows that um, we, we tend to uh, overemphasize at times, but also that our angels uh, are given to us uh, for a purpose and, and when we ask them for something as long as it's good for our soul they they have to go and deliver the message they have to do the work for you okay uh, even if it's repetitive right so it's a beautiful thing to remember that whenever you're going through struggles in your life your angel is always there for you to either guard you or to assist you right well now why do I bring this up on uh, Good Friday. If you ever notice that the the Trinidad, those those three holy days really start at the Last Supper and when Christ goes into the garden uh, to suffer in the garden, who's there with him but his angel, right? And uh, so what do we learn coming out of the box uh, during this this holy time? is that our human side is always seeking comfort, always seeking guidance, and always seeking a higher understanding or a need, right? Well, 
if you look at the life of Christ and you see that when he spoke publicly, everything was pretty clear. In other words, it was clear in the sense that he wasn't wasting a lot of words. And uh, even, even to the point when they had asked him, uh, Lord, how do we pray? He gave them a very simple prayer, right? Very succinct. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Now look at, look at the beauty of, of that prayer. Very tight, right? Honoring God, honoring uh, what we should do even though we're being transgressed against, right? And even when we transgress against someone else, why would he have used those specific words, right? I like to say, if Christ was a born again, that prayer would have went on for an hour. Nothing against born agains. Uh, but he, he didn't do that. He kept it very tight, very purposeful. Every act he went through during his passion and death was very significant. When he was approached by the guards in the garden um, they said are you Jesus of Nazareth he steps out and says I am right what's so important to understand about that is that's a throwback to God the Father I am who am Christ during his ministry would refer to that I am right so much like a parent that's somewhat repetitious with a child They'll do it for two reasons. One is they think the child may not be paying attention, so repetition is, is the greatest educator. But also, they just want to make sure it sticks. They get it. And through Christ's passion, he repeats almost his entire ministry throughout his passion and death. Once again, he goes through it, right? And when he asks uh, Judas, why do you betray me with a, gift, a kiss, he's asking for... Uh, Judas to ask for forgiveness right when he's in front of Caiaphas he says you know why why would the guard have struck him for speaking the truth right when he goes in front of Pontius Pilate once again he speaks of the truth he speaks of his, his reason on earth and he once again reiterates he could have gotten away from all of this he, he chose not to right they even said in the garden, if we go back, that when he said, I am, all the guards fell back, almost paralyzed. And it wasn't until he relieved them from this that they were able to move forward again. Same thing with Pontius Pilate. He could have taken that time and could have ended his suffering right then and there. Right Now, before we go into the actual scourging and his, his walk to the crucifixion let's remember that what Christ had to do was he had to take on all the sins of man and the, the most common question that comes uh, from most children and even from some adults today is number one why did God the Father allow original sin uh, and then off of that question comes, well, why would he have to send Christ to suffer and die for our sins? Why couldn't he have just said, well, it's all good, right? Um, I'm going to free you of your sins and uh, we'll just move forward through this. Nobody has to get hurt, right? Well, we all know it, when we go through our life, um, it is usually the journey of pain that educates us the most we really learn the most from our pain some will even say in their in their marriages or in the raising of their children even though it was so painful i would do it all over again because it was the greatest time of my life right instinctively god knows that unless we earn something okay we don't appreciate anything. I like to call it uh, the trust fund uh, theory. You know, those children raised in a trust fund never have to suffer life, so their life becomes somewhat debased. 
Those who are born into poverty and work hard to succeed greatly appreciate what they've created and earned. And usually the fruits of that are much greater, right? Because why? Because it was that earning of something. And unless we earn our salvation, right? And this is why Catholics are very big on earning our salvation. There is no fruit at the end of this journey, right? So the response to why would Christ have had to die, when you explain it that way, they say, but did he have to go through such pain? Great question. Because what we know, and what is usually not visualized in the art or even the movies, is they usually depict you know Christ with a crown of thorns, a little bit of blood trickling down the side of his head, right? Um, but if you watch the Passion of the Christ, most people can't endure the scourging. And I'll always hear, look, I don't want my child to see that. Or I'll hear people say, I just can't watch that. Okay. Well, here's, here is uh, the sad truth. Even what was portrayed in the Passion of Christ, which was horrific, wasn't even close to what he really looked like and what he really endured, okay? They say that from the moment he was seized by the guards, he was constantly um, punched, kicked, spit on, okay? Through the whole process up until his crucifixion. If any of you have ever taken a punch to the head, you, you would, you'd know, boy, that really dazes you. Now, could you imagine not only being constantly punched and kicked but being spit on and then to be so brutally tortured for such a long period of time, it would have taken a God-man to be able to endure that. But he did, and every punch, every kick, every spit, uh, every lash, every fall represented every potential sin that could be committed against God and that's what people have to remember about uh, Christ's passion and death he he wasn't uh, in, enduring all this pain to say see look what I could handle he was enduring it to say I got to make up for every potential right now here's where we we unite ourselves excuse me for free falling but it's so easy for us to say, well, the Jews handed him over and they were evil people. The Romans were just evil rulers. Uh, the people were just evil people. Uh, the guards along the way that were uh, beating him were evil people. Every, every one of those groups is us. Every one of them. Uh, Caiaphas declaring blasphemy on a rig trial. We do it all the time through acts of uh, calumny, judging people, not caring what, what our words do to people's lives. We all do that. The stirring up of the people almost to a demonic state, we are part of that quite a lot in our culture. We ostracize people that that show the slightest um, failure to comply. Uh, if they don't do it, we're the first to judge them. And so we, we get ourselves worked up against others quite a lot in our life. Uh, Pilate dodging his ultimate authority where he could have had Christ released because he's the only one that could have officially pronounced a death sentence on him. We've done that so many times in our lives when we refuse to do the right thing, when it was just too comfortable to say, hey, I'm not in this, all right? Uh, matter of fact, along the, the road when they grabbed Simon to carry the cross for Jesus, the thing he said is, so you want an innocent man to carry the cross of a condemned man, right? It's so easy for us to say, I'm, I'm not part of this, I'm not in it, right? The, the scourging, now that 
everybody takes part in. Every adulterous act, every lie, every, uh, every offense to the unborn, every offense to children, uh, the, the stealing, okay? Everything that we could ever imagine that we could do, we gotta remember uh, there was a lash on Christ's back or Christ's stomach for every one of those things that we do, right? So what we got to remember is that during Good Friday, when Christ was going through this, and we say we cannot look at anything that really shows what he went through, what we're really saying is we can't look at ourselves and how we provided that lash to him. So every time I, I watch the Passion of Christ and I see, especially when they pull out the whips with the, the bone hooks on it, I, I say many of those bones uh, were mine. Okay, I, I added that lash right, um, to his skin. I, I added that, that pulling of his skin. Now, they say that, and, and they show this in the Passion of Christ, they say that once uh, Christ was whipped, now typically I think the number of lashes a, a criminal would take was maybe 20, right? Well, if you notice, they give him the standard lashing, and Christ goes to his knees, and then the, the guards are comfortable with that, and then Christ stands back up, which totally upset them. They, they, they were saying, we beat you, stay down, and he stood back up. He stood back up because that's that many more sins that he knew had to be suffered for that we were going to commit. Just the normal scourging wasn't going to handle it, so he stood back up. They were so ticked at him that they turned him around. Okay, Now, they would never scourge someone from the front because it was just too sensitive. You would kill someone, right, if you did that. The purpose of the scourging was not a death sentence. It was a punishment. But they turn him around because that soft part of the body, and he takes it both front and back. He takes our sins all on completely, right? Now, many people say, yeah, I've heard this before. But I don't think what we remember is that we're the ones that did it. When he's walking along the road with the cross and he's falling and they're still kicking him, we've done that. When we see people are hurting, we've continued to uh, pile on the pain. How do we do it? Out of our arrogance, our indifference. Um, this idea that it's not me, it's you. To a certain extent, uh, some people look at that as a means of justification that the person's going through that pain instead of putting themselves in the shoes of the person being affronted, right? So if you've ever been either verbally destroyed, physically destroyed, you know there comes that point where you say, did I deserve this? I mean, do I deserve it to this level? Put yourself in, in the uh, feet of Christ. He didn't deserve any of it, right? And yet he suffered every step of the way. But like these angels that get sent to us, while Christ is going through this, there's certain acts of love that come around, right? Veronica comes to wipe his face. His mother comes to hold him. Even Simon carries his cross. So even though we're going through this pain and suffering, God always sends mercy into our life. And that we got to remember Let's not forget that that's what was given to us at that time, right? Again, back to the words Christ used. As he's being uh, accused falsely, he doesn't do what we normally would do, which is, that's not true, you're lying. He endured it. He put his head down and he took the punches. He took the insults. He took the lies, right? Uh, along the, the road to the cross, he took the kicks. He could have said, like Simon said, stop, okay? He 
He could say, I don't deserve this. He could have been weeping all the way in this, woe is me. He took every part of it. And still yet, when they put him up on the cross, now I would say if that were me, I'm dead already. I mean, I'm, I've am i totally given up. He starts lining up very prophetic words, right? He, he speaks to his mother and he speaks to St. John. He turns his church around over to them. Mary over the church, John is the servant of the church. He forgives again on the cross. Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they're doing. Even Caiaphas, who's under the cross, ridiculing him. I mean, could you imagine how ticked off you would be that this is the guy that's making you endure all this suffering, and as you're barely being able to breathe, He's saying, so if you were going to destroy the temple and raise it in three days, why don't you just take yourself off the cross? Doesn't respond to him. When one of the thieves on the cross uh, remarks, if you're so great, get us down off of here, he doesn't respond. He never takes the affront personally because he knows it's not about him. It's about saving the souls of all these billions of people, right? But when a thief asks for forgiveness, and you have to imagine if that was you on the cross and you're just ready, you could barely take a breath. And no matter what the comments are, favorable, you would just let it go. You thought that the reason he didn't respond to Caiaphas or the other thief because he was just purely exhausted. Yet, when the thief uh, Demas says, I'm sorry, Christ says, you will be in my kingdom with me, right? So still that last ounce of energy still is coming out, right? When there's no more to give, he's giving it again, right? Now, there's, a, there's two things that uh, we didn't understand. And one is when Christ says, Father, why have you forsaken me? Okay, the two things in that statement is, is Christ, did Christ lose his faith on the cross? That was always the first one. Number two is, why would he have not known? Okay, what we have to remember is since he suffered in a human way, okay, he felt every bit of that pain in a human way. They say that his God nature, because he was God man, his God nature was separated to endure the pain and suffering because that's the only way man could be forgiven is if he took on the human nature to suffer as a man, right? Him making that comment on the cross was the perfect summation of his human nature. I've been abandoned. I've been abandoned, right? And he's basically saying, if you feel like this, in your life that God has abandoned you know that I too felt abandoned but right after that and this is why it's he's he's always a perfect orchestra in everything he said and did he says father my spirit I, I commend to you my spirit and then it's finished right or he says it's finished and I commend my spirit to you so in that first act of, oh, did he lose his faith? Yeah, so much so that he just said to, to God the Father, I finished the job. Take my spirit. That's, that's the beauty of everything Christ ever said. Everything was very succinct, right? And then he put his head down and he died, right? I always like to think, you know, we'll go, we'll stay up at nights just suffering something we know that's coming. Many of us, we've all gone through this. It could be a job issue. It could be a family crisis. It could be something going on in the world, something going on in our country. There's this, we know it's coming. And we just, we know that the pain is going to be horrific, okay? And eventually when it's all over, there something is coming out of it, good or evil, but there's a finality to it. Christ knew that through all that suffering, that when he took his last breath, that all that he went through, all that anguish was for a good reason, right? 
So why did I decide to scrap the first uh, episode I did on this that perfectly lines up the Mass and what it represents is because I think on Good Friday, we have to go to more of our human side instead of our liturgical side. And we have to remember it was us that were part of that passion and death. Even though it was 2,000 years ago, we are the ones in our time that are adding those lashes to him. We are the ones that were part of the crowd. We are the ones that sentenced him. We are the ones that avoided getting involved. We're the ones that ran away. We're the ones that betrayed him. We're the ones that denied him. And then the passion and death takes on more meaning to us. So even when we're in church and we're, we're celebrating this, we have to keep on saying mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa, right? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm heartily sorry. Why? Because it's because of our cold hearts, our stone hearts, that all this pain had to be endured because we are not trust fund spiritual babies. We know that the only way that we can make it to heaven is one, through Christ's passion and death to open it up for us, but two, we've got to earn it. And we earn it every single day. So every day when you get up and you say, good morning, Jesus, the first thing out of your mouth has to be a prayer to say, please don't let me add another lash to your back. Please don't let me add another punch to your face. Help me through my day to be what you came for for us to be right your followers and and make my life a simple life don't overcomplicate it i don't want all these things in life because i know these things in life that take me further away from you are just adding one more lash one more thorn to the head and that's the prayer we need to say especially on good friday let me not make you suffer anymore. Okay, thank you very much.